Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is James Ide, and here with me is Charlie Cheever, and together we're the co-founders of Expo. And this morning, we're going to talk about the lay of the land today in the React Native and Expo ecosystems, tell the stories of some apps currently using these technologies, and share how we think about using these technologies together will evolve going forward. To start, let's talk about the state of React Native over the past year. React Native grew to over 1.4 million weekly NPM downloads, and that's just shy of twice as many downloads over a year ago. Now, of course, there's certainly a lot of noise and seasonality in NPM downloads as a metric, and context is important, but this gives us a good sense of the directional growth of a te technology. Expo grew to over half a million weekly downloads and nearly two and a half times more than over a year ago. And while most new projects today use Expo, we still see that there's a gap between older projects that use React Native that could benefit from easier paths to adopt Expo. Meanwhile, authors of modules have been a step ahead. Config plugins quickly gained adoption from module authors and are downloaded more than the Expo package. In fact, they're nearly downloaded as much as the React Native package. Config plugins are an Expo invention that lets modules configure the native project files of the apps that they're used in, and they co-locate the configuration that a module needs with the source code of a module. And the module ecosystem that already uses all these config plugins is ready for all these apps that want to take advantage of them. But both React Native and config plugins are still not yet used by most React developers, let alone app developers. Compared to the most popular libraries, React Native is still small. Now, React Proper has over 20 million weekly NPM downloads. And of course, every React Native project also includes React. Well, not all React projects include React Native yet. But with end users spending more time in mobile apps, we also think that the market for React Native is much bigger than where React Native is at today. And there's so much room to grow. And the reason it should grow is because both mobile and the web are where the users are. And if this community succeeds, if the people in this audience build the right things in the right ways, we think that almost every React project should use React Native to reach users on all the platforms that they're using. Now let's talk about some other ways React Native has grown. Some of the themes we saw over the past year from the React Native team at Meta were the quality of life improvements and to see existing projects through to completion. Work on the new architecture that we've all heard of has continued, and more precisely, Turbo modules, which directly bridge your JavaScript to native code in a synchronous way using less data serialization more efficiently, and Fabric, which does the same for native views and also opens the door for new React features like suspense and concurrent rendering. Now, as a quality of life improvement, you can actually write your Turbo modules and your Fabric views using Java and Objective-C rather than C++. Previously, C++ was a requirement. Now, it's just an option. Also, build times with Turbo modules vastly improved. In fact, they're up to over 10 minutes faster due to the React Native package, including pre-compiled libraries. And we know everyone appreciates faster build times. And speaking of pre-compiled libraries, the Hermes JS interpreter is now pre-compiled and also distributed with React Native. Furthermore, Hermes is now the default JavaScript interpreter for React Native as of React Native 70. But Hermes just isn't the default. Hermes is now the majority of apps. When we looked at apps that were built with Expo application services, our hosted cloud services run by Expo, that we call EAS for short, we found that almost two thirds of all apps built with EAS use Hermes. And similarly, when we look at the number of builds, not just the number of unique apps, we, we get a pretty similar metric. 68% of builds used Hermes. And with the release of SDK 48 this February, Hermes adoption especially accelerated. In addition to Turbo modules and Fabric Views and, and Hermes, uh, the team at Meta made several other investments. React Native now works with the latest release of React, React 18. And React Native projects, whether they're using Expo or not, now they all use the same JSX Babel transform as web-only React projects do. There's just one JSX transform for all projects. 
Your TypeScript declarations for React Native are included with the React Native NPM package. So you don't need to keep the at type slash React Native development dependency in sync with the React Native dependency. Tomorrow, Alex Hunt from Meta will share some of the things that they've been working on in the Metro and React Native dev tools. And there's meaningfully more parity with the web. Flexbox's gap property is now here in React Native. <laughs> We've got ARIA accessibility attributes, JavaScript pointer events, and CSS-like syntax for styling properties like transform and aspect ratio and font weight. And this is an area that the team at Meta is investing a lot in, which we find really promising. At Expo, we think that over time, some of the web's W3C common standard APIs will be part of a bigger common API for universal application software. And this is an exciting direction. Which brings us to a few things that we've been working on at Expo. And part of what we do at Expo is we bring together the best of web and native. One core feature that we really like about the web is that every page is linkable. Every page has a URL. And URLs are so fundamental to the web and websites, but they haven't been fundamental to apps that are installed on your devices. And that's why we created Expo Router, the first file-based router for native apps. With Expo Router, every screen of your app has a URL. It's kind of like how with Apache websites, every file on your disk kind of led to a web page and had its own URL. And PHP and Next.js and, and Remix, they all use the same idea. But this is for native apps for the first time. And URLs become fundamental to native apps. And later today, we'll hear Evan Bacon talk about Expo Router in detail and the very exciting possibilities it opens up. Shifting topics a bit, another major feature that we shipped last year was Expo Modules 1.0. The Expo Modules API is our official way for library authors to write native modules using modern, idiomatic Kotlin and Swift APIs. And in addition to first-class support for Kotlin and Swift, it has first-class support for struct-like record types, enums. It lets you easily choose whether you want to write an async function in JavaScript or a regular synchronous function. Data types like JavaScript's typed arrays are natively supported letting you efficiently pass references to large amounts of data across the bridge between functions or even between different Expo modules. And we think this is going to be especially useful for very media-focused modules. And the Expo module API supports React Native's new architecture. In fact, the entire Expo SDK heavily uses Expo modules and will support the new architecture 100% with SDK 49. A recent example of an Expo module is Expo Image. It's a native component that supports modern image formats, like AVIF and WebP. It has built-in support for SVG. It has CSS-like layout properties that many of us are familiar with. And it's fast. It uses the Glide and SD web image libraries for rendering and caching. Give it a try on your app. Additionally, the contributor ecosystem is alive. We looked at Expo SDK versions 45, 46, 47, and 48 over the past year. And 224 people contributed to these releases. Many of you are in the audience today, so thank you very much. And some of these are significant contributions. For instance, Alan Hughes migrated over a dozen modules to the new Expo Modules API. The open source ecosystem <laughs> is active, and we hope to see it thrive even more and make it even easier for everyone to community, in the community to, to contribute to the repo and upstream contributions. Next, I'd like to talk about the state of our industry, and namely, some trends that we've been seeing. One trend over the past year is that companies are looking to do more with fewer people, fewer teams or smaller teams. And productivity and efficiency aren't new, but we're seeing that they're shifting from nice to have to need to have. And we expect more companies are going to need one focused engineering team rather than three for Android, iOS, web, plus the overhead needed to coordinate and communicate between them. 
Another trend is that major governments are investigating competition amongst the mobile platforms. And a lot of this is about rules for in-app payments and stores. In fact, the EU recently passed a law called the Digital Markets Act that regulates these large platforms. And meanwhile, Japan and the US have also published market study reports. And the report from US has one part that especially stands out for this audience. Reading through the report, the conclusion makes a recommendation to encourage tools and standards to increase interoperability and reduce developer costs. This isn't regulation yet, but it's what the regulators are thinking about today. And there are lots of ways to achieve what they're asking for. And we think that a framework for universal apps, if done well, is the best way. Another trend that's been true for a while and is still true is developers feel like there's a decision to be made between making a website and making a native app. And today, making websites is still often easier. And working on Expo, we see the sentiment that developers want native apps and consumers want apps. I'm sorry, developers want to make websites and consumers want to, to, to use na native apps. But we think it actually gets more complicated than that. We find that consumers want to use both websites and apps. Users want to start with a website and then maybe later install the app. They want to browse a website and pick up where they left off on the app on their phone. Or they want to use the app and share a web link with a friend who might not have the app yet. So people want to use both websites and apps. And as developers, we want to give people these experiences. So smaller teams, interoperable tools and standards, being able to provide both native apps and websites, this is what we've been working towards this whole time. Everyone in this room, everyone in this audience sees pieces of an answer that our industry needs. The picture is becoming clearer over time with each new app built with these technologies with each new SDK release and each AppJS conference. And with this, we'd like to next share with you the story of two apps with very small teams who achieved a lot. And one of them, in fact, is the smallest team, just one front-end developer. And to tell us more, please welcome Charlie Cheever. Hi. I'm Charlie, I'm the CEO of Expo. Thanks for having me here. I want to tell you a quick story about the Blue Sky app. A few years ago, when Jack Dorsey was running Twitter, he had an idea about how to make it better. Um, the idea was that it would be better if Twitter was decentralized. And in the same way that you and I can have different email addresses, where maybe yours is at gmail.com and mine is at expo.dev, we can still email each other across those servers. What if you could do the same thing with something like Twitter? So he funded and set up some, a project called Blue Sky to develop a protocol to let networks like Twitter interoperate. Um, and they started exploring this. But then, as we all know, Elon Musk bought Twitter recently, and the idea that you could even post links to competing networks was out the window, much less that you could integrate with them. So instead of the plan being that Twitter would be the first network to integrate into this protocol that was being developed, and then everything would spread from there, the Blue Sky team realized, hey, if we want to make this work, we're going to have to build an app to, get every, to anchor this and get everyone to use it. But they hadn't built a team to build an app. They'd built a team to build a protocol. So what they did was they had one developer on their team who had, um, had some JavaScript and web development experience, spent six months building an app with React Native and Expo, and he pulled it off. And um, this is exciting because uh, it's just really impressive work by Paul. But there's a few other things that I want to highlight beyond this. Um, React Native and Expo are using to power the most talked about app of today. If Blue Sky keeps this momentum going, it could be one of the handful of apps that people actually put in the bottom row of their home screen and open 100 times a day. All of us here in the audience know that this technology has gotten good enough lately to power this stuff central enough to our lives. But it's nice to see it starting to happen in the real world. This app is definitely a V1. The URL for the website is literally still staging.bluesky.app. Um, but people are happy enough with its performance that their functionality, they can't stop using it. Like one cranky cybersecurity poster even posted that most apps make them want to stab their own eye out with a spork, but the Blue Sky app is pretty OK. Um, 
So Blue Sky has a ton of momentum. Um, second, this app targets iOS and Android and web all from a single code base. Last year at this conference, many of the talks are about unifying web and native apps with a single code base. But this year, we're actually seeing that start to happen for real across the ecosystem. Paul, the Blue Sky developer, streamed live, live streamed coding a feature a few days ago. And he had the app open in a web browser and an iOS simulator and an Android emulator all at the same time. A couple of times throughout his live stream, you could actually see a pleasant surprise on his face when he developed something for web and then tried it on iOS and Android, and it just worked right away. We know that web is one of the most important platforms for many development teams. We're making, on making Expo a first-class way to make websites, getting it to the point where it's so good that Expo would be a really good choice to build a website, even if you didn't think you wanted an Android or iOS app. The Blue Side team is pretty awesome and gave us a few invite codes to share with people at this conference if you haven't tried it yet. So find me or Brent later if you're not already in the app and want to check it out. I want to share another story, too, about this other app, the new Brex app. Brex is a fintech app that manages and issues corporate credit cards and other related things for businesses. They recently made some pretty big changes to their product offerings, going from focusing on many credit cards for you to unifying around one card. And they also added a bunch of travel functionality to the app. They already had an excellent app made with Expo and React Native. But Derek Davis and the engineering team at Brex decided to completely rebuild it earlier this year to support all the product changes that they were making. They managed to do this in only six weeks with 14 people, which is pretty incredible. One thing I love about this is how it shows the scalability of React. Sometimes adding more people to a software project can slow it down instead of speeding it up. But Brex's approach here got great productivity from people across their whole team. They spent the first two weeks building horizontally. That means they built all the components and building blocks that they would use across all the the different feature verticals. And by building these in one pass, they were able to great, create this great consistent look and feel across the entire app. The second two weeks, they had product teams dive down into each vertical and build each feature of the app. And then the last two weeks was just testing and polishing. But they got the whole thing done in just six weeks, which is incredible. During all this, they used EAS as part of their testing process. They built a release candidate app that they distributed through TestFlight that everyone at their company could use, including product managers and marketers and people that weren't developers. This is really important since they found a lot of bugs when people with different roles and different ways of using the app gave it a full workout. When they would make changes and fix bugs, they used Expo's update system to push out new versions of the TypeScript app to everyone, and they could update it by just like tapping the logo in the app and verify the fix. We're seeing lots of people use EAS in powerful ways to make their teams work efficiently. The next talk from John Samp will be all about those workflows. And we're going to keep building more workflow enhancements into EAS because we see how much of a difference they can make in speed and quality for development teams. The results of this for Brex were outstanding. We use Brex at Expo, so I know firsthand that the app looks and feels great, and it's really well designed and thought out and executed. Others agree, too, since the app has 4.9 and 4.7 stars in the App Store and Play Store. It's pretty amazing that this kind of speed and quality is now possible with React Native. Changing gears a little bit, one question that I see all the time, and that I'm sure you people see too, is when you read the R React Native subreddit or you look on Twitter, this question keeps coming up over and over again. Should I use Expo or bare React Native without Expo? I want to talk about that a little bit now. We want to make this question obsolete. We always want developers to focus on the important parts of their app, not have to pay attention to arcane implementation details. And it hurts the whole React Native ecosystem when one of the first things developers have to do is make a hard choice that they need to do a bunch of research to make well. Instead, we want developers to just use React Native and Expo. And so we've worked hard lately to make it so you can pick and choose any parts of Expo you want to use without any lock-in or baggage or having to use the rest of Expo. Blue Sky is actually a good example of this. The project started out just using the React Native CLI and being a bare React Native project without using anything from Expo. But then a bunch of Expo things were added one by one as needed. They needed Expo Camera for camera functionality, and they needed Expo Web to target the web well, and a bunch of other things too. So now, any React Native project works with Expo modules. Expo modules use JSI, React's native, inter React Native's interface for native modules. There's a small library provided by the Expo package called Expo Modules Core. In addition, in an app already using Kotlin and Swift, the marginal size increase is only about 150 kilobytes. Any React Native can use config plugins. Expo introduced config plugins two years ago. And since then, 
We've seen great adoption from library authors, and there are now over a million weekly downloads of config plugins. Any React Native project can use Expo Prebuild. Expo Prebuild manages and creates your Android and iOS directories for you in projects that don't need to manually configure those files. And any React Native project works with the Expo CLI. You, one thing you might not know is you don't actually need to be using Expo Go to use Expo CLI. You can compile a development build of your own app that includes third-party libraries or your own custom native code. All these community libraries and standards are open source. And now that there's EAS, a set of paid hosted services operated by the Expo team for doing builds and updates and other things, um, all those things work with any React Native project as well. Apps built with EAS include only the native modules they use. Expo CLI, Expo modules, and Prebuild are all optional. Apps can use any combination of these features, whether it's none of them or all of them, and still be built with EAS build. I just explained to you how you can use each part of Expo separately. But there are actually some powerful and magical things that can happen when you combine these Expo tools together. And I want to share one example of that with you. So when you work on a React Native project, you have an iOS directory and an Android directory that contain a bunch of files that you normally only touch if you're changing something about your app's configuration, like setting up deep blinking URL patterns, writing native code, or installing a native module. Touching anything in either of these directories feels unfamiliar and dangerous and fragile to most React Native developers. For me, I'd say it even feels a little scary. I'm always worried that I'm going to break something by accident. Expo Prebuild fixes that by generating your complete iOS and Android directories for you based on your universal apps configuration files. When you combine Prebuild with config plugins, auto linking, the Expo modules API, and app lifecycle events, you get what we call continuous native generation, or CNG for short. The whole here is greater than the sum of its parts. When you use the CLI to prebuild and run your config plugins, your native project files are continuously generated for you. And your app at runtime is set up to work with the application lifecycle events provided by Expo modules. CNG treats your native project files like rendered artifacts. It's kind of like how React renders the DOM for you and keeps it in a consistent and, and correct state. CNG takes care of your native project files, so they're always in sync with your app config. And it does those across different native platforms. And because any React native app works with each part of CNG, any reactive native app can use CNG today. Um, excluding apps that have lots of accumulated custom native code changes spanning their whole Xcode and Android Studio projects, we think almost all React native apps today should use this pattern. It lets teams move faster and make fewer mistakes and worry about less. This is kind of the whole point of Expo. When you have this vision in your head about an application you want to create, let's make that dream come to life as easily and as quickly as possible, where you're only worrying about the interesting and important and essential things that make your app unique, not arcane technical details. So I think most people here should use CNG in most of their projects. So thanks so much for being a great audience today. We're so excited to be here and crack out with you. And thanks especially to the hosts and sponsors, especially Software Mansion. We've got a great lineup of speakers over the next two days, and I hope you're excited, as excited about them as I am. We can't wait to see what you build. Thanks.